Thank you very much. So first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation. And uh, it's, it's really nice to be here. It, the entire preparation and the microphone seems like a concert, like Justin Bieber. But, so let's see if I actually manage to, to be at that level. But, uh, so no, thanks a lot. It's really nice to, to, to be here. Uh, so let me just say, as, uh, as I was introduced, and actually, I think it's the first time I've been introduced formally by, by somebody. But I'll, I'll be here for the entire week. week. So stop by the office. It's 2.10. Any topic, anything you want to discuss, even uh, soccer, politics, uh, Meloni, whatever, uh, I'm happy to, to discuss and uh, happy to interact uh, and get to know you. So this is a joint work with uh, Riccardo Zago, who's currently at the Bank of France. Uh, and uh, so the usual disclaimer applies, especially given that we are talking about supply curve, monetary policy. So these are definitely our own opinion and not the opinion of, of the bank. And um, so please interrupt me anytime. So we are currently revising this paper for a, a revision. So anything is super welcome. And especially if you buy our new evidences and stuff. So it's really the type of uh, moment where you should say, Daniele, this doesn't fly at all. OK, so please uh, interrupt me anytime. So I've been told that it's a kind of a general seminar, not a macro. So I'll try to be as general as possible. But then we can look at details. OK, so interrupt me any time during the presentation. doesn't need to be at the end or whatever. So I think the title is kind of explaining you already what we do. So the title is Job Polarization, Labor Market Fluidity, and the Flattening of the Phillips Curve. So the entire idea is extremely simple. We are being going to connect something that happened on the labor market, and in particular, something that we will label as job polarization, which is something that I absolutely didn't know anything about before this project, is the idea that the, the types of job are polarizing. So there's an entire sector which are routine type of tasks that are going to be destroyed. And I'll, I'll talk about this. But anyway, there's a big labor market structural reform and how this actually affects something that in macro we teach at macro one, which is the supply curve. And the, the particular, we're going to be looking at the representation of the supply curve, which is the Phillips curve. Okay? And again, this, we will talk about the Phillips curve and what is this. And we're going to be connecting these two parts, labor market and something that is interesting for monetary economics, with something that the change in the labor market does, which is changing the fluidity of the labor market. And just as a preview, what do we mean by fluidity is something that basically tells how much you adjust on the extensive or intensive margin when you work. What does that mean? It basically means how easy it is to fire and hire a person. Okay? This is the fluidity. So a fluid labor market is one where I adjust, basically I fire the guy easier than in a, in a setup, like for example, I would uh, use Italy as an example, that is kind of rigid. It's super complicated to fire a person, therefore it's really complicated also to hire because you're stuck with that person for a while. Okay, but after this long introduction on the title, let me try to motivate the paper by showing two figures, which are kind of well known, but again, let me uh, get to the point. So the first uh, figure is the slope of the Phillips curve. Now, we all know what is the, the Phillips curve is. It's a negative relationship between prices and the real economy, where here the real economy is measured by unemployment. Okay? So what is, does it mean? It basically, we are thinking of a negative relationship between unemployment, so more unemployed people should actually lead somehow to lower prices and lower changes in prices. So in particular, here we are going to be estimating a Phillips curve, which is a change. So basically, it's an inflation measure, where for inflation, we will use in the paper a bunch of robustness, a bunch of measure. But here, it's core inflation. OK, so it's inflation when you take away uh, food and energy. And we regress it on a measure of an unemployment gap. OK, so what is an unemployment gap? It's simply unemployment where you take away a linear trend or an HP filter, or a natural rate of unemployment, everything is robust. Here we are basically using an unemployment gap because basically we are just taking a linear tenor out, right? So what is theory saying is that theory says that there should be a negative supply curve, OK? Meaning, uh, sorry, a negative Phillips curve. Therefore, meaning a positive supply curve. So when prices are actually up, firms are willing to actually produce more. Seeing on the labor side and through the Occam's law, this means that when unemployment is low, 
prices are, are going to also be lower. Why? Because the idea is that if prices are low, also the cost of producing is going to be. So we estimate this Phillips curve. And the important thing, and why I'm spending a lot of time on this, is because there's really a, an ample debate on what the Phillips curve is today. Okay? Why? Because now, if the Phillips curve is actually flat, it means that monetary policy is useless. And I've been working for now like the past four years in the monetary policy division strategy of the Bank of France. And so the entire conception was, can we still influence prices or not? Can we still influence inflation? Okay. And so what are we estimating here? It's a rolling correlation of eight years, where on the x-axis you see the starting date of the rolling window on the relationship between inflation and unemployment. What do you see? We see you see a negative value, so everything is, is squared in the sense there's a negative relationship with, with prices and unemployment. But this negative relationship is actually decreasing and even potentially becoming insignificant if we see in the last period. Okay? All these estimates are ending up before the COVID crisis is actually important, because then we had a bunch of shocks that we could not take into account. Now, the Phillips curve is estimated using the usual set of control. These are robust. We can discuss all of this. But here inside, you have expectations of current prices. You have past inflation. You have import prices. And I mean, there's a bunch of other things. And alpha is basically a trend component depending on, on the country. This is actually going to be shown and estimated for the core where the core, I mean, not Germany, but the first 11 countries that uh, formed the European Monetary Union. Why 11, not 12? Because Luxembourg has kind of weird employment data. So we are going to be focusing on the first uh, countries that formed the European Monetary Union. So what do we believe this figure shows you? And what is the first motivating fact? We see a flattening of the Phillips curve, meaning, in a different way, that now the relationship between prices and unemployment has and kind of been broken. What is the second fact that motivates our things? And this was, yeah. So you would see something extremely, so the, the question, I don't know if it's, I need to repeat it. Yeah. So the question is, what, what about the US? OK, is that similar to the US? And the answer is, yes, has been a flattening, but was way previously than what happened in the European Monetary Union. Okay, And we will talk a bit about this when we actually see the debris. Yeah, there has been a flattening, but doesn't seem to be so connected to the Great Recession or the, the things at the European Monetary Union. Yes? Uh, just to confirm, I was thinking that even the, <clears throat> the link in the new technical, the link uh, between uh, uh, inflation and the unemployment goes through uh, wage inflation, right? So what I was wondering is whether this kind of things you observe also for wage inflation, and the, there is also today a debate how wage inflation maps into price inflation. This, that might have changed as well in the Absolutely. last period. So uh, the question is so good that it's anticipated by like 15 slides. So the, um, the answer is yes. We've been seeing a flattening of the wage Phillips curve. But we don't have the evidence on there because it's a bit puzzling on how we measure wages and stuff. But we, I'll show you that what we think that the mechanism is through which the price Phillips curve has been flattening is exactly through the wage Phillips curve. But I mean, on that, the estimate of that object of the wage Phillips curve is a bit more complicated in the literature, especially because of the availability of the data on what do you use in terms of wages, unit labor cost, and stuff. But your intuition is perfectly correct. So for that, the, the, the talk is going to be, yes, the mechanism goes through the way the marginal cost works, and therefore wages for firms. But I'll be talking exactly about the new Canadian framework and how this maps into this. Okay. Any other question on, on this? Second fact, and again, this was kind of new to me that I was not a labor economist, is what is called job polarization. What is job polarization? So on the x-axis, you have years. And on the y-axis, you have the share of employment that is dedicated to tasks that are routine tasks. So something that you actually repeat. And in particular, they are clerical, plant, and craft type of jobs. Okay. And what do we see? You see that this type of task has been decreasing over time. Okay? So you see it. You basically see this, again, an aggregate for the European Monetary Union. In the paper, we have a plot for each single country. 
it really looks like something that, again, was coming from the U.S., that we learned from the U.S. by work by Yasemoglu, uh, Yaimovic, et cetera, is that the routine share has been uh, declined. Now, a question that you could actually have if you were like, if you are like me that didn't know anything about this type of things is, yeah, but this is a share, right? So it has to add up to 100%. So it means that somebody, some other jobs are actually increasing. And so if, when you actually look at the other side where job polarization literature usually divides the labor type, types and the labor tasks in a routine, abstract, and manual jobs, we see that what actually was destroyed by routine was actually captured by abstract employment. Okay, because when then you start looking at manual employment share, it seems that basically things are um, quite stable. And you see these are non seasonally adjusted uh, type of series. Okay, so the fact that the second fact that we use to motivate our work is it seems that there's been a quite dramatic change in the way the labor market functions. And in particular, there has been a destruction of routine type of tasks. Now, if you go to the literature and you actually look at the Semoglu paper and stuff, they say that this is actually due to multiple ideas, for example, technology, technology that are actually taking away the type of routine, routine tasks and, and this type of things. Okay? So what is really this paper about is putting these two things together. Okay? These things that, I mean, get me the, the seemingly unrelated events, and we actually try to understand if these two things are indeed not unrelated. Okay? So what is this paper doing in a nutshell? It's basically testing if this big labor market reform had a role in the flattening of the Phillips curve. And in particular, so the composition of the job ladder and the changes in the composition of the job ladder as um, an effect on the slope of the Phillips curve. And the second is, if so, why? So we try to understand through the lenses of a new Keynesian model, the simplest possible model we could think of is why is that the case, okay? And um, to give you a preview of the results, the answer is not surprising, yes. So it is, there's a really an important link between the labor market structure and in particular what we experience in terms of job polarization and the Phillips curve up to a point that we can explain to a one, up to a fourth of the flattening of the Phillips curve due to labor market reforms, uh, so the labor market uh, changes. And second one is that the channel through which this goes is the fluidity of the labor market. Okay? The channel that we are investigating and we highlight in this change in the structure of the labor market is the fact that routine jobs were more rigid, so it was way more complicated to fire and hire in person than the abstract types. Okay? And I'll try to convince you in this. Yeah. One conclusion might be then that uh, labor markets, the evolution of the labor market makes uh, monetary policy increasingly useless. Exactly. This, this could be a, a point uh, that we are not going to sell this paper at the Bank of France in that way. But, uh, but clearly, what is that uh, this paper is pointing out, and I think that's actually an interesting is saying, Careful, because what happens in the labor market, which is out of the control of monetary policy, is clearly affecting how monetary policy is transmitted to the economy. Okay? So when we actually start looking at this type of reforms, and when we think of also the fiscal impact of structural reforms, we need to look at also the ability of monetary policy to influence this. But the short answer to uh, your question is yes, in a way. So some types of labor market reforms are actually indeed flattening the supply curve and therefore making monetary policy less effective, right? Because the entire idea that is hinting in the question is think of it as a super flat supply curve. Now you can start moving aggregate demand as much as you want, but prices do not change at all. And therefore, if prices do not change at all, monetary policy, given that they have one objective, which is price stability, are basically useless, okay? So... In a way, what is actually saying this, and again, here it's a parenthesis that is not really in the paper, but it's something that is actually effective today, right? So if COVID, and if the disruption of supply chain, and if the fact that basically in the past two years, manufacturing jobs restarted, okay, quite more than services because we could not travel and stuff, this is changing the way the labor market works, and therefore this is probably changing also 
the slope of the Phillips curve itself. So what is this paper saying is that we should actually monitor way more closely what happens to the labor market in order to understand how monetary policy can be affecting in the time or not. But then we will see all the empirics in showing and convincing you of this. Yes, yep. um, a fairly naive question. The fact that the share of routine jobs uh, decreases, this has to be a long, long term trend, right? So it has, to, it has to have been going on for more than 20 years. Uh, maybe. So do we see such a long, long, long term trend on the flattening of the Phillips curve? Or? So again, it's a super good question because he's basically hinting in everything that we are going to be seeing from now on. So the point is, OK, is this has been going through a long time? And the answer is yes and no. So there's a trend. And here we clearly, and one of the big points of the paper is we are going to be estimating a trend. And the trend is actually common across all European countries. And therefore, we cannot use that for identification. We can use, and we'll talk about this. But it's not been going long for long. So it's really coming at the beginning, so end of the 90s, okay, from the 2000s, at least in Europe, while in the US was actually earlier. Now, have, have we been seeing a massive uh, change in the, in the Phillips curve since when we saw the share of routine? I would claim that yes, but it's clearly not the only driver. Okay, because clearly job polarization might have also an effect on the level of prices in a way because technology might decrease marginal cost and therefore the entire prices could have a jump and this type of thing. So the long answer, the short answer to your question is it's a really good point. We will actually exploit the fact that there's a trend to convince you that job polarization has a role in, in the flattening of Phillips curve. Is that the entire story? Completely not. Do we find a perfect mapping between job polarization and the flattening? No. But it's still one of the drop, and we, we claim that it's like one fourth, so, so like uh, this. But that's actually a good point. And actually, what is actually interesting is that if you believe my story, and now you have no clue yet of the story, but it allows me to respond to this, is that job polarization, so change in the labor market structure, had an effect through our story to the price Phillips curve, okay, so the, the, the slope of the supply curve, through fluidity, okay. So basically saying, if we destroy routine jobs, and now we have abstract jobs, and if routine jobs are more rigid than, than, abst uh, than abstract jobs, we see a flattening, otherwise not. So basically what I'm saying, in the US, job polarization might not have exactly the same effect. Why? Because routine jobs and abstract jobs were exactly the same, and we could fire a routine worker exactly the same ways as uh, abstract jobs. So the entire channel through which job polarization might be working and could be not through the entire time is through the type of contracts that abstract and routine has. So on the fluidity of the labor market itself. So is not job polarization the topic of the talk? Is that job polarization is actually changing the structure of the labor market? And we use job polarization to identify clearly one possible uh, channel through which uh, the labor market changed. Okay. But that's a really good point. And hopefully, I'll be convincing you of this later on. OK? So let me, uh, if there are no questions on the overall theme that was a bit long, but I think was worth it for, for a general audience to enter in a bit, let me try to then dig a bit further in the paper itself. OK? And um, not surprisingly, we are not the first one in investigating the potential driver of a flattening of the Phillips curve. OK? There's an extensive literature, and as I was asked, that was actually true for the US and the Euro area. Okay? Now, out there, we can categorize the possible answers of why the Phillips curve has been flattening in three blocks, or at least we try to uh, categorize it in three blocks. The first one, which is mostly related to the US, is an idea that is as simple as striking that can actually be summarized in three equations. Okay? Now, think of it as the price Phillips curve as a relationship between current inflation with expected inflation and a whatever measure of the real economy. In this way, it's basically the output gap. Now, if the Phillips curve is still alive, we should have a negative relationship. The small k should be negative, and there should be a negative relationship between inflation and the output gap. Now, think of a world in which we are approximating the expectations of inflation are made partly by current inflation. So what we see today in supermarkets, and partly on how much we believe that the central bank is actually able 
to hit the target, okay? So inflation expectations are what we see today and a bunch of like target that the ECB was, uh, so the, the central bank was actually addressed. Now, what it means, it means that you're basically making a weighted average between how much I think that the central bank will hit the target and how much I see today. Now, if you put these two equations together, simply by substitution, you see that today's inflation is going to be a function of today's situation, okay? So basically how the economy, how much unemployment there is, how, what is the output gap, and the target. But what do you see? You see that the weight on what the, the, um, uh, the inflation expectations are on the target is appearing at the denominator. So what does it mean? It means that if I do not believe that the central bank is going to be able to hit the target and therefore I sign to my expected inflation zero, so alpha equal to zero, to what this ECB is actually doing or the central bank is actually doing, and I only look at current inflation, this object goes to infinity. Okay? So basically, it's a super steep uh, Phillips curve. Now, as alpha increases, as I put more and more weight that the central bank is actually going to be satisfying in doing what it told me to do, then the Phillips curve is going to be flattening. And so current economic conditions are affecting less prices. Okay? So what is this? So basically saying that the entire literature looking at the US is mostly saying if monetary policy became good in anchoring expectations, so basically the monetary policy was actually able to hit the target and therefore change the inflation expectation, we should see a flattening of the price Phillips curve. Now, why is this important, for example, today? It's for what is happening in the UK, right? If you look at the last week, one on Twitter was everywhere, but one of the big debate was the Bank of England seems to be having responded to what the government is, therefore basically risking that agents do not assign to what the central bank says its ability to hit the target a lot of credibility, okay? So one of the big um, explanations of why the Phillips curve is flattening is that central banks are more credible. Now, is that the only end, like only explanation? No, there's a huge literature on structural changes, demographic dynamics, technological change, and there's a literature where we are contributing that is on labor market dynamics. For example, one other story is on bargaining power of firms and bargaining powers of firms and workers. Okay? Now, this is far from being extensive. I know that uh, quite a lot of you worked on similar topics. Don't take, if you're not on the list, uh, don't, don't get personal. It's just a, like a bunch of, of citations in the paper. You find the extended list. So we tried to contribute to this part in saying there seems to be something that is related to the labor market dynamics that has been so far kind of overlooked that, that is actually important. Any question? OK, so let me move to try to convince you that there's actually a relationship and there's a causal relationship between um, the change in the labor market and uh, inflation dynamics, OK? Now, look at these two things. So the first thing I could do as an undergrad is to plot a correlation between the demeaned change in the routine share and the demeaned uh, estimate of the price Phillips curve for each country, for each rolling window, okay? Why do you see a lot of points? Because basically it's for every European Monetary Union country in each, so each eight-year rolling window. And what do you see? You see a negative relationship. What does it mean? It means that countries that had a larger um, uh, share of routine employment also had a steeper Phillips curve, okay? So this is like really, this is a significant correlation, but it's a correlation. Then you could say, Daniele, but this, I mean, this is not even undergrad. doesn't even pass the undergrad level. Yes, sure. But I would suggest always to plot correlation before starting doing a bunch of other things, okay? So what are we after is trying to find a way of identifying and basically making sure that those two are not spurious correlation. Why? Because as we just discussed, both uh, series are both trending, like an omitted variable bias, bias that could be sectorial change, or we are actually capturing country-specific or other component. 
So in order to assess like causal relationship between labor market structure and inflation dynamics, we need to find a variation in the composition of the labor market, which is unrelated to trends and unrelated to c country characteristics. Okay. So, and here is where it comes handy, the job polarization. So here it's where our idea of job polarization arrived, okay? So up to now, when we were actually thinking of what to do, we had an idea of labor market structure and flattening of the Phillips curve. But here it's where job polarization comes handy. Why does it come handy? Because, exactly as we were pointing out, there's been evidence, and there's a paper by Yamich and Sue, that shows that job polarization only a trend factor, but there's a cyclical factor out of it. Okay? So there's longer run trend, but this trend accelerates and accelerates during the recession. So what do we do? We go and estimate a trend across all the 11 European Monetary Union countries, and we find no statistical significance in the trend of destroying uh, routine jobs. Okay? But what do you see is even though the trend is always the same before and after recession and across countries, we see that there are episodes in which this polarization accelerates. And these are basically the recessions. Okay? So what we are going to be exploiting after some tests that I will tell you is that the change in job polarization caused by cyclical components are not due to the trend, are not due to labor market characteristics, and are not due to inflation dynamics before the recession. And so we use this shift, this uh, one-time change during recession of job polarization to assess the importance and the causal relationship between job polarization and the price Phillips curve. Okay? So the first thing I need to convince you is that these shifts are heterogeneous across time and across countries. So what are we me measuring here? What is this shift? Is the difference between the peak and trough of the share of uh, routine jobs clearly uh, normalized by the peak, across two recessions. So we were lucky enough, and this is completely uh, luck, that we have two episodes of recession, which were different in nature, different in sizes, and hit heterogeneously countries. So this is actually a crucial component, because now we have heterogeneous, remember, we had the same trend, but now we have shifts which are heterogeneous across countries, and across time, why? Because these countries were hit differently by different recessions. Okay? So, because one thing that we will be testing in a second, you could say, yeah, but Daniele, maybe everything is due to the fact that one country like Italy or Spain had really a large share of routine jobs. So what you're capturing is just the fact that they had to be doing it faster. Right? But then you look at Italy and you see, wow, Italy had completely different changes in the two recessions. That means it's difficult to believe that in three years, Italy changed that much in terms of labor market structure, such that the first recession was not that bad. Actually, routine jobs, if anything, increased, and then they decreased massively. Okay? So this heterogeneity is going to be crucial in our panel regression. What I want to highlight here is basically saying, okay, across countries, the shift, so the difference between the peak and trough, were actually quite different. And not surprisingly, for example, if, if you believe our story, and I'll try to convince you, is that Greece were hit way more by the sovereign debt crisis than the Great Recession. You see, indeed, that the shift during the Great Recession is way larger. So the red line is way larger than the blue line. Okay? Now, you could still argue, and this is what I was hinting, is that these shifts are completely driven by other previous country characteristics. So what I need to convince you here is that those shifts are completely driven on by recession and not by pre-trend or labor market characteristics ex ante or uh, inflation dynamics ex ante. So given that I'm doing OK on time, let me just quickly try to convince you. Not here. Anyway, I'll do this. Is everything OK? So that when I try to do again my bad correlation between a measure of the shift where I, that I put all the time on the axis and other bunch of possible explanation, and here, for example, I put routine share before the recession or the, the trend 
or I put, for example, sorry, the share of manufacturing, so basically the, the share of manufacturing component, or the inflation, I do not find any statistical correlation between these two. So it really seems that the characteristics pre-recession were not the driver of the changes in heterogeneity across those peaks. What indeed is a driver, and clearly statistically significant, is the size and the length of the recession. Okay? So it really seems that that shift is big or small, depending on how much that country was hit by that particular recession. Okay? And now, maybe you can claim that the Great Recession impacted different countries because their labor market structure was different, and this I could buy it. But it's difficult to believe me that Greece was hit harder than Germany by the sovereign debt crisis because the labor market was different. Okay? Literally, the sovereign debt crisis was a shock that hit their cost of borrowing because of their credibility. It has nothing to do with the size, for example, of the labor market or their routine share. And this comes super clear. And in fact, not surprisingly, Greece is kind of always an outlier because of the sovereign debt crisis. Okay? So hopefully, and I mean, if I'm not, maybe we can discuss later or we can discuss whenever you want, convince you that this shifts, so the destroy of routine jobs were not due to other characteristics in the economy, but really to the length of and size of the recession. But now, if that is actually the case, I found an exogenous movement in job polarization that I could actually test if the flattening of the Phillips curve was driven or not by that object. Okay? So what do we do empirically? Something that is super simple. So we augment our estimated Phillips curve that was the line that I showed you before, the equation that I showed you before, by testing, okay, was there a structural change in the Phillips curve after the Great Recession? And if so, how much was actually due to the job polarization? So the way you should see this equation, forget about reading and follow me, is that the first one we are estimating the Phillips curve. The second line, and it's gonna be a column later on, the second line we are testing if indeed, after the Great Recession, the Phillips curve has been flattening, and if it did, how much was actually due to the job polarization. And this is how you should see the table. The first one is, does it exist, the Phillips curve? Is the Phillips curve still alive? Yes. We have a negative relationship between prices and employment, which is statistical significant. Okay? So monetary policy should still be there. Now, did we see a flattening of the price Phillips curve due to the Great Recession? The answer is yes. So, before was way more negative, now has been flattening, okay? Now, is this structural change in part due to the fact that we had job polarization? And the answer is yes, okay? So it seems that once we control for every other possible explanation that the Great Recession was generating a flattening of the Phillips curve, the job polarization shift did explain part of this. And now, how can we be testing this? And how can we convince ourselves before then convincing you that that's actually the, the case? We were lucky enough that we experienced, uh, lucky maybe it's not the right word, a second recession in the European Monetary Union, okay? Which was the sovereign debt crisis. So we do exactly the same test, but we check that after, if after the second recession, which is the sovereign debt crisis, we still can assign to the job polarization something. Why? because we saw completely different shifts, so we have some heterogeneity to exploit. And so, again, the set of controls are the same. Think of this as the classical response to a referee, where you do two millions of uh, appendix, where you try to test the robustness of everything. This is quite robust, but it's independently on what you put. And what we see is, is exactly the same. The Phillips curve existed, was way steeper before, it flattened after the Great Recession, and it flattened after the sovereign debt crisis, even though this is not statistically significant. And part, actually a significant part of it, a statistically significant part of it, is due to the shift. Okay? So this is kind of the baseline analysis in which we claim that we found a good way of identifying exogenous movement in job polarization, and we map it to a flattening. Now, one thing that should come to your mind is, and you should raise your hands, and this was 
something that we have been learning while doing this, is that, yes, but there was another big change in the labor market, probably, coming to sectorial shift. Okay, so what are we plotting here? Is the share of manufacturing construction in employment in, in two particular sectors, which were not services, which were manufacturing construction. And what do you see? You see something similar, right? You see a declining, so we are moving to, to, from a manufacturing economy to a service economy. So you could claim, yeah, but what you're really capturing because of job polarization is the destruction of manufacturing jobs towards uh, services. And in fact, if we do exactly the same measure of shifts, but now it's not a shift of uh, job polarization, it's a shift of the share of sectorial changes between manufacturing and services, what do we see? We see, again, that there's a, a, an heterogeneity across the things. And so what do we do? We say, careful, because maybe what we are capturing through job polarization is not job polarization itself, but is a change in the sector. So what do we do? We, we do exactly the same analysis before, where we add the shifts of manufacturing. Okay. So the idea is, pass me the unprecise more like way of saying it, it's a, like a, a horse race between different shifts. Okay, we put them together and we see if job polarization get washed out by the fact that the, we, we, we are moving towards a service economy. And the answer is no, it doesn't get washed out. And if anything, and we are actually working on this in a bit, if anything, the manufacturing, the change in manufacturing services seems to be working the other way around. Once you control for job polarization. What is interesting is that if you were to put only the shift in the service economy, so basically saying, I would be running the regression before by saying, how much is due of the flattening of Phillips curve towards the fact that we move to a service economy, you would find a positively a statistical significant object here, saying that you are pushing toward the conclusion that yes, indeed, moving towards a service economy flattened the Phillips curve. What is interesting is that as soon as you put the job polarization shock, things are going the opposite direction. So it seems not only that it's not driven by manufacturing service, but if anything, manufacturing services are steepening and not flattening the Phillips curve. Okay? Now, you might actually say, okay, wait a second, Daniele. Okay, you use the lagged unemployment because there's endogeneity. Yes, but there's even more. What are we experiencing today? Supply shocks. And supply shock, what do they do? They move prices and unemployment exactly in the same direction. So what does that mean? It means basically that unemployment and inflation might be spurious correlated. Okay, so what we want is we want a measure of unemployment shifts, which is not co-moving the two sides. Basically saying that the, um, there's a relationship that is not exogenous between the two. So what do we do? Uh, we use monetary policy shocks to identify unemployment movements that are not co-moving with prices. So it's a different way. It's basically we are using a two-stage least square type of regression, and we say, okay, we are well aware that unemployment is endogenous, and there's an endogenous relationship between uh, prices, so inflation and unemployment. What if we try to isolate only movements in aggregate demand, so monetary policy shock? Okay, we take uh, the monetary policy shocks of Jalodinsky and Karadi, and which separates information shocks from monetary policy shock. We redo our analysis and everything goes through. Okay, again, here I don't have to spend too much time, but everything is actually going through. Okay, now let's go back to the question. Now, as we will see in the theoretical part, but as was previewed as the first question, which uh, was really uh, good, is that if we see something on the price Phillips curve and we believe that there's something related to labor market characteristics, it cannot be unrelated to wages. Okay. So why did we spend a lot of time on price and we didn't go directly to wages? Because wages are a bit more complicated to measure and we have really bad proxy for it, especially in Europe. Okay. So what do we do? We do exactly the same thing. We are now, the only difference is if you imagine the equation that on the left hand side we have the year on year change in the unit labor cost index. Okay. Is that a good proxy for wage? The answer is 
so-and-so. Is that the best that we could do across all countries? Yes. Did we try with surveys? Yes. And did it work? Yes. But we had it for one or two countries. Okay. So we could not do a cross-country as we wanted. Anyway, believe us that things are a bit more complicated for wages, but the story goes through. Okay. So the story goes exactly in the same direction, even when we instrument for unemployment movements with monetary policy shock. So we see a flattening of the wage Phillips curve, and the flattening of the wage Phillips curve can be driven by the shifts. So meaning that job polarization indeed flattened also the wage Phillips curve, meaning it seems that, yes, the change in the labor market structure went through the labor market and also through wages. Okay? So this kind of concludes the, our empirical analysis. Yep. Just one remark. The last two coefficients are positive now. Not yep. Exactly. So now the, the, the question was uh, pointing out exactly on something that I wanted to hide. No, just kidding. Uh, is the fact that now when you actually include also the shifts in manufacturing and services, those become positive. So our shifts in unemployment, like in job polarization, are still flattening. But in manufacturing, when you actually look at wages, it seems that you have a flattening. And this opens up something that I think should be written. It's another paper. Because it seems that there's something related to marginal cost that is going in the same direction. Therefore, job polarization and the destruction of services flatten the wage Phillips curve. But then there's the transmission between how marginal costs are transmitted depending on the manufacturing and the type of jobs, which is different. Okay? So in a way, and this could be, but again, this is super speculative, it could be also related to imports. So as we know by uh, a bunch of, uh, of papers out there, the import prices are changing the Calvo coefficient and the slope of the Phillips curve outside marginal cost. Okay, because now you are importing and exporting goods. So there might be something in the paper to be written, and here I talk to PhD students and whoever, and uh, that might be a different channel through which the two things are actually affecting the slope of the Phillips curve once you take away the marginal cost. Okay, the marginal cost seems to be working in the same direction, but when you actually look at uh, the transmission of marginal cost between services and not, might not be exactly the same. So, Markups, exactly. That could be a, exactly one of the things explaining, once you look at the marginal cost, indeed that changes. But then when you transmit it because of the flexibility of markups, could actually be completely changed between service and manufacturing. Absolutely. Yeah, that's actually a good idea. I've been thinking about it. But yeah, totally. Variable markups, the entire literature now could actually point uh, in uh, trying to understand this difference. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Daniel. On the first table you were showing us where actually... First, uh, Meaning yeah, the one first, where, first. yeah, this one. So what is that? So that basically means, if you follow your story, that in this, if you see just this evidence, that the, it's not the, the manufacturing sector. Ah, no, okay. Is, yeah. Sorry, yeah, no, that, yeah that, this that, one. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. right, right. Sorry. It's not more fluid, right? So the story about the, the job polarization was about fluidity. No, actually, and uh, so if I want to look at... Just, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, just okay. the question was basically, can you give us an example of what is something that you have in mind that is fluid as in the job polarization story, but not when you look at the manufacturing sector, for example? No, and actually, I think, so when I, so perfect point, and I think it's perfectly correlated yeah. with this question. So when you actually look at, sorry, I'm going the other way, fluidity, we should actually look at this. Okay, so is indeed fluidity, and in fact, it flattens also the wage Phillips curve. But the way it is actually transmitted to the way pricing are made, this is different. So my, I mean, let's get away a bit from me defending the paper because I want to publish it. But so I, I think that the story is that fluidity is there. Okay. So, and I'll explain it through the model, but the entire intuition is that fluidity flattens the labor demand curve. Okay. So the labor demand curve has become more flat. So you like adjust on unemployment and not on wages anymore, okay? So basically you fire a worker or you hire a worker because you need it, an architect, okay? While for routine you had to hire it, it had a super long contract and that was it. So that is actually the same if you have a service of manufacturing. But there's something 
that we do not highlight in the model, that is the way you actually transmit your marginal cost movements in the services versus manufacturing, which is not related to fluidity. And I think one great idea is what I had in mind was import and exports, okay, that basically imports are way more comp competing the manufacturing more than the services, because services is a bit more difficult to export, even though they are becoming. But one idea could be markups, completely different pricing setups. But this, uh, this I'm, uh, I'm ignorant, so I haven't studied it. But my claim, at least is my claim, is fluidity would work also through services. And the only problem is that this is endogenous. So why don't we focus on this is because this change, we didn't find a way of isolating the transition between services and manufacturing, which we could claim that that was a exogenous. So we focus on job prioritization because of that. But uh, that, that Yeah, we'll talk about fluidity, but yeah, good for the model. Amazing. <laughs> made new jobs less old jobs, right? So, could it be that you basically pick up episodes where labor markets change? So contracts change, so the new ones coming in are basically less stable than the old one, and this increases fluidity? You are our referee, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly this is what our referee asked, and this is what I'm going to be showing you. Okay. So we have a part now on the paper where it's actually uh, it became another paper, but which we exactly look at like liberalization, employment liberalization reforms, and we tested our hypothesis. So. Hold it, because we have an entire slide on that, is exactly saying, if we are right in this channel, we should get away from recession, get all these episodes of employment liberalization reform, and see the same effect. Do we see it? Yes. Okay. So, but, perfect. I should have this talk before sending the paper with you, but anyway, next time invite me earlier. No, just kidding. Um, so, it's exactly this, but uh, we will discuss this uh, later on. I need to first uh, show you the model, what is our idea, but I'll show you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I don't know if the video hears you. I don't know. Yeah, sorry. Uh, you, uh, it's okay. Uh, maybe I, mi I missed your explanation at the beginning, but I didn't really understand what is job polarization simply. No, no, that, that's uh, I, something that I completely didn't know before. Job polarization is that take 100% uh, of the jobs out there, divide them between uh, uh, manual, routine, and abstract by how much you use your, your hands, basically, okay? So the zero is you totally do it by hand, and the last, you don't even use it, okay? So it's a scale. Job polarization is that the middle side, which are routine tasks, are dying. And so the, the two shares on the right and left-hand side are increasing. So this is why it's called polarization, okay? Mm -hmm. So basically, the idea is the destruction of routine tasks, okay? okay? Substituted by machinery and stuff. And this is the way it's called in the literature. The fact that now routine tasks are disappearing. So usually we divide the society in three categories? I mean, yeah, they divide. So, yeah, exactly. That's the idea. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks a lot for the clarifying question. OK. Any other question on the empirics? OK. So now we'll be quite fast. So the idea, or at least my idea at the time, was Let's try to find a possible explanation in a super simple setup, okay? Why? Because I wanted the results to be analytical, okay? I wanted to be able to derive it by hand what's actually coming up. So there's a lot of assumptions, a lot of caveats, but I think this gives us a nice intuition. It's a framework where we can actually understand things. Why? Because models that are more complicated, that can only be solved numerically, is really complicated to measure something that is a derivative, okay? Why? Because if you think about it here, we are actually trying to understand how changes in labor market might affect the transmission of the Phillips curve. So in reality, what we want to do is sort of understanding a derivative, but on a numerical model, this is actually quite complicated. Why? Because of the Lucas critique, and why? Because basically the entire model structure changes, okay? So what do we, we pick? We picked the standard new Keynesian model with two things that we needed. Unemployment, why? Because we have a Phillips curve, okay? 
and a way of matching workers and employee, okay, by saying we have some bargaining power on some side, some under, so basically we do search and matching type of models, okay. It ends up that this model was already done in 2010 by Blanchard and Cali, so we took basically their model, which is the new Canadian that you teach to a first year graduate student in monetary economics, where you put unemployment and uh, search and matching, okay? So these are the two things. Why is that important? Because you see that only with these two things, but still having an analytical framework, you find that labor market structure matter. Why? Because they change. So think of, if you have in mind the new Keynesian model, is simply inflation on one side, you have Calvo parameter, like how much you can adjust uh, prices, et cetera, times the marginal cost, okay? So usually what is the slope of the Phillips curve is called basically the, the component that we call Calvo parameter, which is basically the discount factor and Calvo parameter. Now, what this model does is that says, wait a second, when you estimate the Phillips curve, there's also like a relationship between marginal cost and unemployment. There's also a slope here. So when you actually aggregate the two, you, Matter. So basically, in the economy, matters also the labor market characteristics. And this is what you see analytically in this model. So labor market characteristics jump in the picture as long as you have search and matching and unemployment. Why? Because they influence the way marginal costs adjust to basically slack in the economy. And in this case, slack is measured by unemployment. What is the parameter that in this type of model go governs this uh, transmission, this elasticity of marginal cost to unemployment is labor market tightness and labor market fluidity. Okay? The idea is basically saying our workers, when they actually lose job and when, the, um, when their boss is going to hire them, are they adjusting more wages or basically the stock of employment? Okay? So it's more on the extensive or intensive margin that we are looking at. Now, I'm not going to be presenting the entire model. I've been saying, again, this is not a super uh, macro specialist, and I would get, like to get feedbacks from all over. So it's a really standard model. I have separable utility in mind between consumption and hours. I have log utility so that I can forget complicated components that I need to bring out so income and substitution effect cancel out. What is the most important figure or equation that you should remember of this model is this. So as soon as you have a search and matching, you have like an accumulation equation where we are used to see it in capital, but now it's in hours or in workers. In this case, it's workers because we have unemployment. So is the stock of employed people, is the stock of employed people yesterday where a fraction delta gets separated, okay? This is the separation rate. This is something that is going to be probably changing or we claim is changing because of the routine destruction. And then you have new hired, okay? And then the matching will depend on the market tightness. And then final goods are monopolistic competitive, so you have Calvo pricing, and everything goes, goes through the same. So what we are, enti the entire intuition we have is that job polarization is changing this delta, okay? So the fact that basically before you have routine jobs, it was way more complicated to fire a routine job, like a routine worker, than hiring a new architect. This is the entire intuition we, we learn from the model. Now, you do some algebra, which is simple, but not as simple, so I'm not going to go through it. Basically, you derive an analytical expression of the price Phillips curve, okay? Where now you have a perfect mapping of what we call unemployment and inflation. So we have an analytical slope of the Phillips curve. What do you do after this? We claim, okay, what can change in this model because of job polarization? The only real thing that can change it is uh, the separation rate, because separation rate is also affecting the labor market tightness. So what do we do? We take this slope of the Phillips curve and we do the derivative with respect to delta, okay, to the separation rate. And what do we find? We find that in that setup, if separation rates increase, so if delta increases, market tightness increases but less than proportionally but what is really doing is that is flattening this object so basically it becomes once you take away the, the negative sign this decreases okay so we move to a world where the fluidity affects the transmission of 
the economic slack to prices. And how, how can you do it? And again, here it's because uh, my brain is extremely simple. So I had to map this reasoning into labor demand and labor supply. And you can show that this effect can be basically simply, I didn't put the graph, but anyway, sorry. Uh, you can simply map it into a flattening of the labor demand sketch. So if you think of a labor demand where you put wages on the y-axis and uh, employment on the x-axis, you have a labor demand, basically, you want to hire more when uh, workers are cheap, it had become flatter. What does it mean? It means that now adjustment in the real economy are need a way smaller adjustment in wages. So it means a small adjustment in marginal cost. But now if you think about it, how the new Keynesian model is set up, so the new Keynesian is the prices related to marginal cost, that doesn't change, but marginal cost relates to unemployment. And the flattening labor demand curves means that the marginal cost is going to be changing less. Now what is really changing is hiring and firing people if you increase fluidity. Okay? So a flatter labor demand exactly triggers this type of setup where you now have a flatter Phillips curve because the adjustment works in terms of how many people you hire and fire because it's way better than adjusting wages because labor demand is flatter, is more elastic, okay? So now what is the last step? So we think that we at least learn one potential channel. Is that the only one? No way. But in this type of framework, we learned that labor fluidity could actually affect this. So what we learned from the model, we want to test it empirically, okay? And so now we try to basically understand if the shift from routine jobs to non-routine jobs indeed has the effect that we think of. So basically, if now moving from, from routine to non-routine jobs increases overall fluidity of the labor market, okay? So here we start digging into survey data and we try to compare routine, abstract, and manual jobs. Well, manual is in parentheses because we saw that the manual share is kind of constant. Okay, and see why? Because if routine jobs are less fluid than abstract, and now abstract have a larger weighted share in the aggregate, we should see an overall increase in fluidity. Okay, and so the first thing that we we find is like a measure of the separation rate, so delta. Okay, we try to measure it properly in the paper. There's all the technical details on how we do it. We use survey data. We basically we follow surveys in firms that actually are asking how much you fire and hire people. We track those firms, et cetera, et cetera. And then we compare it across types of jobs and uh, because we have both sides. And what basically comes up is that routine share is the one that is more rigid, okay? So that there's a lower delta. And to be honest, this is kind of my, my prior before, right? So routine tests have that kind of old type of of contracts where people were there for the entire life. There was really little uh, movements across types of jobs. While abstract is a bit higher and manual is the highest. And probably this is also due to the type of jobs that manual. Did, do you remember that I showed you the manual and was super cyclical? I mean, this could be also people in agriculture that are seasonal workers and they, they can actually change right away. So you can actually hire and fire them quite quickly. I don't know if you uh, go and try to uh, do seasonal types of things, uh, you, you see high fluidity. Yes? Uh, yes. Is, uh, is one part of the explanation cannot be the, uh, the exposure of the economy to foreign trade? Because routine jobs in the uh, um, service sector, they are not exposed, while manual workers are exposed to international competition. And uh, when you have an open economy with uh, uh, um, an objective of the uh, equilibrium of the um, external balance, uh, then you are uh, meant to, uh, to adjust manual workers. Absolutely. Because in the industrial sector. Yeah. So, Basically, if I understood your point, but get me right. So you're saying more you're exposed to international competition, 
more you might need to adjust, right? And therefore, this is exactly one of the potential points. So we are not studying what are the drivers of this, but is it exactly true? As long as maybe this and has been shifted towards economy, which are more sensible to price competition, markups and stuff, maybe you need types of uh, contracts too that are actually more uh, more flexible in terms of one of the two margins and not of on the price ones because otherwise you lose markups. And in fact, I mean, this is exactly what we tested after, right? So one of the things that at least uh, in my opinion, or at least in my history, was really different from before when I actually entered the, the labor market was that all my friends after university had temporary contracts, while all my parents always had permanent contracts right away. Okay? And so also the type of contracts that are actually done makes you a sense of how easy it is to fire or hire a person, right? Because if it's a temporary contract, you just not renew it and they're home, and it's way more fluid. And so if you look at it up, I mean, and again, we, we measure through surveys and, and stuff, you see that abstract jobs have way more temporary contracts than routine and manual. And this could be one of the adjustment, like of the uh, adjustment that I'm talking about, so that it's easier to not renew a temporary contract, while if you're stuck with a permanent contract, it's difficult that you adjust on this, but you actually adjust on wages, okay? And one other component that this is actually hinting in is probably something that has been studied in another paper, which is really interesting and uh, similar to ours, which was on the bargaining power, okay? For example, unions, that could be uh, one way that if your contracts are really not temporary, you need unions to bargain the entire setup of wages. Now, what is the other uh, evidence that we try? is, for example, another component that I was thinking when I was thinking of my friend's architect, I don't know why I have this example in mind, but is that they often have multiple contracts at the same time. While routine, they were working for their company for the rest of their life. And again, this is another measure of fluidity. Why? Because you could have in good times a lot of contracts while in the bad times less. And so this is a, the probability of having multiple contracts at the same time is way higher in abstract jobs than in manual and routine, okay? So again, all of this can hint to a different stories, the one of international competition, the one of markups, the one of basically manufacturing versus the other. But it really looks like if we believe that this gained power with respect to this, on average, we are moving towards a more fluid type of job. What is the last exercise that we do it? And not because it's the last important, but because we, we did it thanks to referees. And I mean, this is one of the reasons why it's still uh, the blinded review process is actually good because sometimes you work for two years with zero improvements in the paper, but sometimes you have good ideas. And uh, what Andreas was actually saying is exactly the idea that we said. So if our claim is labor market composition, labor market structure matters for the price Phillips curve, and the channel is labor market fluidity, that doesn't have to go through job polarization shock. That could go through APLF reforms. So what are this? Our employment protection liberalization reforms. Okay. So these are episodes where the labor market changed. Okay. Up or down. And here we are we were lucky enough that there's a paper by Duval and, and co-authors in the IMF where they actually map all the EPL reforms. So every time that the labor market changed, okay, and we had a liberalization or an increase in tightening of the labor market. So it's basically a narrative series that says, is the labor market more fluid or less fluid or less liberalized or more liberalized across all the countries we had? And they do it globally, but we picked uh, the 11 countries. And in the 11 countries that we are actually after, we had 19 episodes of liberalization. So what is our idea? Is that we are mapping this in a symmetric way for the moment, okay? You can think of no linearities, but we haven't gone through. But anytime you have like a liberalization reform, this is a proxy for fluidity, meaning that the workers are more likely to get separated from their employer, right? That's exactly the idea of a liberalization reform. Now, is it good bet for the economy? That's the entire literature that we are not after. But these are exactly shock to the liberalization, okay? So to the fluidity. And what do we find? We can map and we can bring along the countries to what is the coefficient of the slope of the Phillips curve before and after 
the reform, okay? Across these 19 episodes across different countries, okay? And what you see where the red line is at time zero, so it's exactly when the reform happened, okay? And now, sure, reforms are endogenous to economic situation, to governments, to all the type of things, but we thought it was exactly a nice experiment to have something that is not related to job polarization. It's again another shift, a possible shift in fluidity and how that affects. And what do you see? Remember that the coefficient was negative. So every time it increases, it flattens. Okay, so it's less negative. Okay, I don't know why. Maybe it would have been better to show it the other way, but we decided this way. So before, you don't see anything happening statistically significant to the slope of the Phillips curve. Now you have a reform that basically liberalizes, because even if it's the other way, we, we map it symmetrically. And it seems that on impact, nothing really happens. But then as soon as two, three years happen, we have indeed a flattening of the Phillips curve. Okay? And I mean, this, this is not a conclusive evidence for sure. But we claimed, and we had the idea, thanks to the referee, and, and Andrea said exactly the same point, that we thought this is kind of outside our picture but gets a good measure of a change in fluidity of the labor market, and we indeed see an effect on the price Phillips curve. Okay? So, this is basically what we're working on now. Now, one thing that I would like to maybe ask you in a way, and again, this is the idea of, uh, of me improving the paper, not really of selling you how good I am, but the idea is that the referee is basically saying, yeah, okay, Daniele, you... you you kind of like convincingly told me that job polarization is not a function of what the labor market is, right? But you cannot convince me that the labor market is one of the driver of how big your recession is, okay? So the risk is that, okay, if your market is really bad, maybe your length and size of recession is higher, okay? And so... What we did, we did a bunch of tests with time t minus one, et cetera. But I'm really against the idea of trying to find evidence that the labor market does not matter for the transmission of shocks in the economy, okay? I'm really, I don't believe that's true. I believe we live in a world in which the labor market status has an effect on how your, basically, your economy is able to adjust to shocks, okay? So now what we are trying to find is a good idea of saying, yeah, sure, the labor, market, the labor market itself is like a channel through which the shock could be higher or lower in the country, but is not one of the main drivers of this job polarization shock. I think that the reality is in between. So I think this shock is really not driven necessarily because a sovereign debt crisis is not driven by the labor market, but is actually likely to say that Greece maybe lasted longer because their labor market was not able to uh, generate a sufficient resilience to this type of shocks, okay? So if you have any suggestion on how we could convincingly separate our job polarization shock from, let's say, the labor market transmission of uh, the, the, the impact, so the transmission of shocks to the economy, which is not related to labor market, let me know. I've been thinking of this for the past uh, three months, and I didn't come up, and I really don't want to find any evidence in which labor market doesn't matter for shocks because I don't think that's the reality and who cares about the referee itself in a sense I think that's the macro and this so but if you have any idea it's super welcome okay so let me conclude I'm I should be on time actually four minutes in advance but so this paper is really simple we say labor market changed this affected how this, the uh, supply curve works so it flattened the, the price Phillips curve so we should actually monitor a bit better in terms of monetary economics what happens in the labor market Okay, if you think again, the example I was making before with the COVID situation, et cetera, and we see that it was a, like a potentially interesting driver of the flattening of the Phillips curve. And we believe that one of the channels through which this works is fluidity of the labor market. And now with some sort of like external validity of labor market reforms, which are employment protection legislation, we find that indeed it generates a flattening of, of the Phillips curve. Okay, so this is a really everything I had to to say, and this is kind of the, the setup we work. But any, any suggestion, uh, really happy. So thanks a lot again for, uh, for having me.